as the industry has evolved a bit, you guys can evolve too in kind of what the, the needs are. Yes, we don't want to be the obstacle. We want to help people get to yes. Licensing process, it's a little more streamlined and easier to understand. Having all these things online has really made it a lot more efficiency and increased our turnaround time. It's not time for a victory lap. It's time to keep improving upon what we've done. Welcome to the BizCast powered by Google. I'm Amanda Marlowe, and this week we are joined by Brian Caffarelli, Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection. Welcome. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being with us here today. You were appointed by Governor Lamont uh, as Commissioner in 2023, but you're no stranger to the public sector. Tell us a little bit about who you are. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, I mean, I'm a lawyer by trade. I went to UConn. Uh, I graduated a long time ago in 2003, and I went into private practice at first, but I've always had a passion for politics. I was involved in some campaigns, and it drew me to the Capitol. Um, I served as the chief of staff for the lieutenant governor at the time uh, for Michael Fideli under Jody Rell. And then after that, I went back to the private sector, so I've kind of been in and out. And I came back uh, most recent, well, actually, after that stint, I came back to work for the Division of Criminal Justice as a prosecutor in the Stanford Norwalk area, and then to DCP in their legal team as a drug control attorney. From there, I uh, went to the Senate uh, as caucus counsel for the Republicans, and I was there until from 2019 through 2023 when the governor uh, asked me to interview for this job and ultimately appointed me and I was confirmed by the legislature. So it's been an honor. Um, it's been it's been really a great experience and I'm I'm very thankful to be here. And you had kind of, like you had mentioned previously, worked um, in this department before. What makes you so passionate about this line of work? I, you know, I think it's the, the amazing people that are there and the work that we do for the people of Connecticut. Um, I was focused on the drug control, as I said, but it's amazing to see how many areas that the agency actually does cover um, and really the good work that we do every day on behalf of consumers. Yeah, and I think when people think about DCP, consumer, consumer, recalls, you know, protections, um, but you do have a lot of touch points with businesses to kind of yeah. To talk about this, can you talk about the the breadth of industries that you cover? Yeah, sure. I mean, we cover everything from, we have a liquor division. So when you think about going to a restaurant or a package store, but also the wholesale and distribution and manufacturing of liquor, the breweries. Um, we started with a medical marijuana program in Connecticut in 2013, 2014, it was stood up. We were a leader in the nation on that. And then that obviously in 2021, adult use, the recreational um, came into law. And so we oversee all of that gaming. So the land-based casinos, all online operations, the lottery. Uh, in 2021 also, that was a very big year for, uh, we were tasked with a lot in 2021, the agency. Um, the online gaming came to be with, first with sports wagering and then all the other activities that followed so that is robust foods. Um, so things you eat that get to the grocery store, all the warehouses, we're in charge of that. Weights and measures. So when you pump a gallon of gas, we're the ones who make sure that that's actually a gallon. And similarly, the weights at the grocery stores. Um, unfair trade practices is a big area for us. So looking out for the consumers and bad actors, people that have a pattern of practice of doing things that are wrong. And I will say, for the most part, people in Connecticut and the businesses are great, but there are some bad actors like everywhere. And so uh, we have a huge complaint center. We take thousands of complaints and have some great resolutions on behalf of customers, uh, consumers. Really, it's a mediation between um, kind of the businesses and the, and the consumers to try and see. Sometimes there was, well, oftentimes there was lack of communication on one part or misunderstanding. So if we can get people to terms on that. Um, we also have uh, occupational professional trades. So um, the, the trades and the building trades is a big one when you think of heating, plumbing, electricians, 
HVAC, elevators, and but the professional side of things too, accountants, land surveyors, architects, and the likes. So we have our plate very full. Um, I will say the other thing that I'm very proud of is we have a Lemon Law program that um, was the first in the nation and really does, it embodies what the agency does so well in terms of making consumers whole who, you know, just got a raw deal. So if, if you bought a new vehicle and you've had uh, a certain number of issues with it that the manufacturer can't resolve, we assist customers in either getting their money back or a new car. And so it's been successful in working with uh, car manufacturers in doing that. And what do you think, you know, in terms of since you've kind of taken over the position, I know obviously the cannabis industry has been big, um, but what are kind of some of the other big focus areas or that you've seen more attention on in the past couple of years? Well, I, um, I think to your point, cannabis is, um, very robust. I mean, it's a new market. It launched, uh, even though the law passed in 2021, it launched the, in 23, the first, um, so we're almost two years into it. The first retail establishments opened January 14th of 23. And that was a function of we needed to make sure there was capacity in the market. So the growers had increased from just providing to medical to being able to provide to the retail adult use side of things. And also to make to get all the licensing and lottery done. And um, so that's one aspect of it. Um, so we're constantly standing up and licensing new um, uh, establishments there, both on the grow retail, but delivery, manufacturing, there's a whole industry really that's growing around that. Um, the online gaming as well. But um, other things too, I mean, it's somewhat evergreen uh, in one sense, but also new. Scams and frauds are a big thing for us. And so we're always out there trying to stay ahead of them uh, and making sure that we're doing our best to educate consumers and those that do fall victim to a, a scam, trying our best to make them whole and get some resolution. And I think, you know, on the business side of things, um, it can be overwhelming kind of understanding the regulations. Um, are there any things that you, you know, messages that you have for the business community or kind of what, what's your communication um, with some of these industries in kind of helping them, right? Because you don't really have to step in until you know, for enforcement, but really at the beginning is compliance. Well, we don't have to, but <clears throat> we like to before enforcement, excuse me. Um, and I, you know, I will just kind of harken back to when I first started, the, the governor had a few marching orders. One was do no harm, which was um, a little easier for me because I knew the agency and had relationships with them. But the other was, you know, see what we can do about making one of the biggest regulatory agencies, a little more business friendly, of course, without sacrificing our guardrails to protect public health and safety. And so there's always been an eye towards that um, when we go about our daily kind of business. And so it is not enforcement. We really do focus on compliance. And to that end, it's meeting, it's communication with the industry. So it's it's easier for us to communicate with those that we license because we have all their information. So we have a good dialogue, if you will, with them. But in terms of the general business community or those potential licensees looking to do business, we for you know we have a variety of ways that we get out. This is one of them, but we meet with market participants or potential participants all the time. You know, I spoke to a group of pharmacists uh, last week, but we're out at you know we're going to be speaking to the trade the building trades next week, talking to them about things from our agency perspective, but just as importantly, listening because that's what I really believe is that there's a dialogue that has to occur because we don't have all the right answers. They don't. And so often, you know, there oftentimes we'll say, oh, you know, we hadn't looked at it that way. And that maybe there is something we could do. Not always, but it's worth the conversation. And I think that that's what we've encouraged and found some good, good ideas coming from that. Are there any, uh, can you kind of expand on that a little, anything that comes to mind that you kind of did, weren't really necessarily as aware of and you've kind of adjusted a little bit or have a, a deeper understanding of? Yeah, I mean, several. One, the use of technology. 
And I think industries as a whole have really appreciated what we've done. There's been a huge push um, before I got here, but um, definitely doubled down since I have. And um, it helps in terms of the licensing process. It's a little more streamlined and easier to understand. There's kind of an online quiz to say, I want a liquor license. And you go to the website and it asks you questions and you answer very simple. We try and keep it in like plain language, simple questions, and it will direct you. And all of a sudden the wizard will have you, well, you don't need one or this is what you need. And the application's right there and you can fill it out. Having all these things online has really made it a lot more efficiency and increased our turnaround time. So people are getting licenses quicker, they're getting answers quicker, and they appreciate that. Um, but another thing too is um, the cannabis industry. We have um, you know, had conversations with them, especially a newer market, understanding what's working, what's not working. Um, when they understand why or the, in, you know, the kind of the, the thought behind some of the regs that are there, why we enforce the, the, the provisions that we do, um, it really is much more helpful. But listening to them, we've had throughout the summer, we've had some good changes to the cannabis regulations for the market participants to make things that perhaps were necessary in the beginning to make sure that the industry was on the right path. And um, we, you know, it was a fair and equitable market, but more importantly, it was safe that we, there was no access to children and that it was a safe product for people to use because that after all is the goal of having a regulated market. And so now as the, the business, as the industry has evolved a bit, you guys can evolve too in kind of what the, the needs are. Yes. Where the protections go. Incrementally. Yeah. So <laughs> not everyone got everything they wanted, but, um, you know, it's these are. And, and again, I must preface this with we're not the policymakers. That comes from the legislature and the administration. We execute. So, you know, there in terms of when we are given authority to promulgate regulations, to kind of fill in the blanks, if you will, because we are the subject matter experts, we do. But on a broader level, oftentimes people come to us with challenges that really we can't help them with, but we can point them to the right direction at the Capitol and who to testify before and, you know, give their good ideas to. And, you know, that that dialogue is so important. I think one of the other things that we've seen this year is there's been really in the last few years, the amount of new startup businesses is really monumental in Connecticut. I know you don't touch all of the industries, but certainly a number of them, you know, are coming in for the first time. And those regulations, like we said, can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, but kind of what kind of touch points do you have with some of these new businesses? So we work... Uh, hand in glove with our sister agencies. Um, this brings to mind DCD, and and that's come from the governor too. I mean, they we are not silos. We all work together. We have one mission: it's to serve the people of Connecticut, in one form or another. And from DCD's perspective, when they have people come to them through many of their programs, sometimes it will filter its way to DCP because if it's a relevant license type to us. And so that connection is seamless coming from DCD. And we will walk them through, like I you know, mentioned the, the wizard for the you know, people who find our website and wanna know if they need a license. But we both have information online, tools online, but people who will support new businesses and kind of um, hand, hold their hand if they need it and to get to the right license type that they need and make sure that they get there. And if there's kind of unique situations, which we, we encounter all the time, you know, I can think of a few right now about liquor permits that are a bit kind of, you know, it doesn't fit in one box or another, but we want to make sure that we, we don't want to be the obstacle we want to help people get to yes. And so that's really what the mission is too, so that we want to get people licensed. We want to tell them how to stay in compliance and we want to just let them go do their business. Right. And so that's really the overarching theme of what we're doing. And so to get people licensed, we'll do whatever it takes within the confines of the law. I mean, we certainly can't, you know, you know, tell them that it doesn't apply to them wholesaling, but there are ways to make them understand you know, how it can fit. And we've done that with great success. And in terms of, you know, communication, kind of really getting things out there is, is your website kind of the best 
format that you've noticed in terms of reaching out to business, the business community, but also for them to kind of come in and say, hey, I need some support or what other ways, where's the communication? I know you mentioned you meet with industry groups. Um, what are some of the top things? Yeah, I mean, it depends. So um, it, it can be through the website. We do, we do have a presence online too in terms of social media. Um, it is through industry organizations such as yourselves or trade organizations or um, you know, the, the restaurant association comes to mind or the wholesalers when the, there's a package store association. So if there's some issue that's relevant to a large portion of them, their lobbyists will sometimes reach out to us on behalf of them. We're always you know, meeting with the, the participants to kind of understand what the, you know, their challenges may be and filtering them to the right path so that they can um, find it. But as you know, I think you'll hear from a lot of industries, look, regulators get a bad rap, but we do have an open door and there's always room for dialogue and, um, you know, reaching some type of consensus if there's a possibility of doing that. And I know we touched a little bit on the beginning, but I think one of the things people don't realize that DCP under your realm is those occupational licensing. Um, you know, obviously, especially with with buildings, we talk about, you know, more and more housing. How do we get more people to the state? Well, there needs to be, you know, and in terms of the housing market, there's a lot of touch points, right, with, you know, plumbers, electricians. Can you talk about your role and kind of what the, the processes are um, in terms of those licenses? Sure. Yeah. Um, so we are the licensing entity. Uh, we have, again, a great relationship with the Department of Labor who oversees the apprenticeship program. So that's really where you get your start for most of these trades. Um, but essentially, the best thing to do is if you're looking uh, to get some more information is to look to our website and you can see the list of licenses that we issue. Um, the bottom line is that you'll complete an education, take an exam, and apply for your license uh, through us, ultimately. Um, so we're, we have that information out there. Um, it is somewhat technical by the trade that you want to get into, but once you realize which trade um, you want to go into, there's very clear indications of what you need to do. So, um, you know, and again, there's, there's contact information to reach those divisions directly, either by email or through an online chat or a telephone call. In terms of um, occupational licenses, is there one kind of industry or trade that you've seen the most ac um, activity in? Uh, it's hard to say. Um, you know, our, our number one registration for the type of kind of trades that you talk about is something called a home improvement contractor. So that's not a um, licensed trades, but it's just those people that are out there um, doing your deck or roof or some type of, you know, handyman type services. And so that does not require um, an education, but it does require registration with the, the department. One of the benefits to that to consumers is that it allows them to access a guarantee fund should something go wrong, which again, you know, we're not looking or hoping for bad actors, but sometimes there are. And so we do have a way to make consumers whole and then go after that bad actor so that you're not out that money because oftentimes you've put up a deposit and they've kind of left the state or they did really shoddy work and you have a hole in your a house where there should be a window. And so you don't want to wait two years for a lawsuit to resolve and we'll get you that money up to $25,000. Again, that was a policy set by the legislature and then we'll go after them. And, uh, so again, that's why it's so important to check with the department from a consumer. I got to give that plug. Yeah, I know yeah, it's CBIA, sure. but, um, from a consumer perspective to make sure that who you're dealing with is licensed or registered with us. But because if, if they're not licensed and you are getting a situation with a bad, bad actor, it makes it a little bit more difficult for you to kind of follow through. Uh, well, two things. One, it, it, you really shouldn't be dealing with someone who doesn't have the wherewithal to, you know, have the proper license because there's probably other red flags about that entity. But secondly, um, for home improvement contractors, the only way to access that guarantee fund is if it was performed by a registered home improvement contractor. Uh, but back to your original question of the trades and the licensed ones, I don't see any one over the other. I mean, there generally is a very, it's a very active profession. 
Um, we do have a lot of individuals in the pipeline um, from the apprenticeship coming through um, from DOL to the agency on a regular basis. Again, we've streamlined so do, that. Does the program, sorry to cut you off, you, I know you mentioned the relationship with DOL, but the apprenticeship program, if you know some of these people are kind of going out on their own, does it do they help that, assist them with those licensing or do they kind of hand it off to you at that point? I'm not sure I understand the question. So a lot of these people are coming through apprenticeship right. programs. So you said mm -hmm. DOL works with them and then yeah. you do. So where do you take over? So that's good. So that, and again, so what we've worked to do is streamline that because it was a bit of a clunky process okay. yeah, no, this is where people, would, where I was going with it, <laughs> they would tend to, and it would through no fault of anyone, but it just happened to be that these systems built up on their own, but we looked at it, we said, well, this could be better. And so it's now all working in the same system computer wise so that it's an automatic transition for once those individuals have completed their application, their apprenticeship, it triggers it to us. So we're aware of it. We set up the testing process. Once the test is done, they feed into our system and we can get them licensed. And again, we've cut down, I wrote down some, um, we took that back the initial application for the exam process from a third party and we cut the application issue wins from 126 days to 64 days. So huge progress there. And, um, you know, I just some stats here for you. We received uh, applications uh, last year, 32,000 renewals, 185,000. Um, but, and again, the rate is staggering of what's gone online too, and just how it makes it so much easier. For yeah. People. It sounds like that digitization has really kind of cut down numbers because nobody wants to be waiting 120 days. No, right? <laughs> no. And that's been a big push of the governor and he, you know, to his credit has given the resources necessary to, to get that done. Do you foresee even shorter times in the future? You know, what, what kind of, what can people expect to see next? I think more of you know, the kind of the, this path or trajectory. I mean, there's no reason to stop because, you know. Yeah, it's not like, okay, we're digitized <laughs> and we're done, right? It's not time for a victory lap. So it's time to keep improving upon what we've done. It's incremental like most things. And so, again, we're always out there looking to see, you know, how we can better things for ourselves, which translates into the betterment for a user experience, both from a consumer standpoint and also a business standpoint. Do you we think that digitized it? Oh my goodness. Do you think that digitization has really helped um, both the consumer and the business? For sure. Yeah, there's no question about that. But that's not the whole point. I mean, the, again, there is the personal side of things too, and we're available, you know. Awesome. Well, I think, you know, I'd like to kind of transition a little bit now. Um, you know, obviously you have, you came into this department at a pretty critical time, as we just talked about with the cannabis licensing, the gaming, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot going on, a lot of new businesses, the trades are, are booming. What are some of the lessons, you know, that you've learned in terms of your team um, managing, especially through this kind of shift moving to a, a more digital side? Yeah, I mean, I think one is that, you know, you say the team, it does really take a great team, um, that there's a lot of dedicated individuals, and it's very helpful to surround yourself with people who are intelligent, really energetic, and want to do the right thing. And, I, you know, the DCP has, has that group, and it's exciting about it. And it's just as important to have those people around as it is to support them. And so give the resources that they need and autonomy and decision-making process so that um, they can do a better job for everyone and their team. And it goes, you know, the, it's, it goes throughout the agency. Once you kind of set that tone, it's fun to see. Um, which leads me to kind of my next point is that I knew it, but I can say it from personal experience. Now, there are a lot of exciting things happening in Connecticut, you know, as you're out there, there's just so many different areas of, from your perspective, business and industry in Connecticut that are just growing. And there's, a, there's a great workforce out in Connecticut. I know you need more, but there's just a lot of people doing a lot of great and interesting things. And so again, we want to make sure that we're there, not as an obstacle, but to help them do it. But it is very exciting to see. 
So it kind of really helps propel you forward oh, when you're yeah. seeing all the new things happening. It and keeps all of us going. It really does. And those, you know, new businesses adding kind of going through the process is just the economy really only continuing to grow. It is. I mean, it doesn't mean, like, I don't say that, that it's just new and novel industries. Yeah. It's just the, the industries that, you know, you and I think of, or that the agency regulates that there's, they're growing and that they're doing more unique and novel things within their own industry. So it's, um, it is helpful to do that. I mean, that's one of the things that we did speak about too, is that, we had paid a lot of attention at the agency to the newer business, you know, markets, but really wanted to make sure that we were focusing on our kind of meat and potatoes, if you will. Existing the businesses, yeah. legacy businesses. Yeah, right. Yes. So to speak. That's, that's very good. That's what I was looking for there. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, those are the, the businesses that, are, you know, have showed a commitment and they're going to continue to power on, but maybe yeah. they need some more support than you initially thought. For sure. And so we went back and looked at all that from top to bottom and saw what we could do to make things a little more helpful to people. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, you know, really appreciate your, your time here today. And thank you for listening to this week's BizCast. You can listen, like, and subscribe to our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us a review and let us know if you have ideas for a future podcast. And for more episodes, head on over to cbia.com.